Good morning. This one is not live, so I will use my booming voice. Good morning. And welcome to the Ford School. I am Sarah Mills. I am a research here at the Ford School in our Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. Our acronym is CLOSEUP. CLOSEUP does applied policy research on a range of state and local issues, but one of our specific initiatives looks at renewable energy. Um, the work that we do in Close Up on Renewable Energy is largely funded by the Ford School Renewable Energy Support Fund. And it really takes a view that there are a range of state, local, and federal policies that either facilitate or hinder renewable energy deployment. Um, the, from the media or even some policymakers often focus on some of the big name climate policies. So there's a lot of attention on carbon tax or renewable portfolio standards or cap and trade or the Green New Deal. Um, and those are all important. But in order to have an energy transition, we're going to need to deploy a whole bunch of clean energy infrastructure. And so it's equally important to look at policies like siting because that controls the rules of where you're allowed to build infrastructure. It's important to look at tax policy, both to make sure that clean energy developers have um, a financial incentive that can actually afford to deploy this technology, but also to make sure that there's something, some economic interest in it for the communities that, you, that would host that infrastructure. Uh, the, the work that we do at Close Up considers workforce development policy and making sure that there are people that are trained to be able to have that clean energy transition come to fruition. And I can go on and on. But importantly, a lot of these policies that we talk about here are on renewable energy. And we know that a, a transition um, and achieving carbon neutrality is going to take more than just building more renewable energy. That's why I'm really thrilled that we were able to partner with UM's global CO2 initiative to bring Carl Hausker to campus to better understand what getting to net zero will entail. I want to acknowledge the other co-sponsors of today's event, uh, the School for Environment and Sustainability, the Graham Sustainability Institute, and the Center for Sustainable Systems. And I also want to say thank Susan Fancy um, from the Global CO2 Initiative and Bonnie Roberts, who's probably still running around in the back, uh, from the Ford School for making this event happen today. Um, and now I want to turn it over to Professor Volker Sick, the director of the Global CO2 Initiative, to introduce our speaker. But thank you again for being here. Sarah, thank you for being the local host. And Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled for any opportunity that um, I personally and I think us as a global CO2 initiative can have to uh, engage with all the schools and colleges on central campus. We're sort of in the periphery of, of the city on, on north campus. But, uh, but of course, today we're looking at, at climate challenges and, and solutions, which is, is perfectly aligned with what we do at the global CO2 initiative. And um, we will hear today from Dr. Karl Hausker, um, who is um, our guest today, coming to us from the World Resources Institute, where he leads the climate program. And putting things in a broader perspective to see what the challenges are and how we arrive at sensible solutions. At first glance, things might make sense, and upon closer inspection, um, they don't. We will certainly hear from a leading expert in this field. Um, one might say actually the expert in this field. He has been engaged in uh, climate-related uh, programs for more than three decades. And uh, at WRI leads uh, analysis and modeling of climate mitigation, electricity market design, and um, social cost of carbon. Uh, he has done so many things that I could easily use up his speaking time here. No. I don't. No. I, I mean, having spoken with you yesterday, I know that I need to spare any second I can. Um, so acknowledging your work for the Clinton administration uh, uh, in the EPA and uh, towards um, interagency climate policy development in COP1, 
Uh, also saying that you supported as chief economist the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. You certainly have um, put your degrees from uh, Berkeley um, and uh, Cornell to phenomenal use, and I'm so pleased that you're here today, Carl. That's it. The floor is yours. Thank you, Volker. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to all the sponsors uh, of this. Really appreciate the chance uh, to speak here at the University of Michigan. I think it's important that we set the stage first by going back 66 million years to a lecture hall very much like this uh, with a climate change expert speaking to the dinosaurs assembled. The picture's pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world's climates are changing. The mammals are taking over. And we all have a brain about the size of a walnut. The dinosaurs went extinct. Uh, they didn't mitigate the, the uh, asteroid that hit the Earth. They didn't adapt very well. Uh, fortunately, we have brains larger than a walnut, and we are going to solve this problem. Uh, we are going to mitigate uh, global warming. We are going to adapt to the warming that is in the pipeline. Uh, that job has begun, and it's going to be carried on uh, for decades to come by the students in this room. Let's roll up our sleeves and figure out how to do it. Here's an outline of what I'm going to cover today. The net zero challenge, how to take emissions down to net zero by 2050, uh, consistent with uh, the IPCC 1.5 degree report that came out over a year ago. I'm going to focus on three takeaways from that report. The needed transformation of the entire economy, particular attention to pathways to decarbonize the electricity sector, and finally, the em an emphasis on the need by mid-century for carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere. I'm going to focus some special time on the renewables revolution. We all know that the cost of solar and wind has come down. How far can wind and solar take us on this journey? And I'm also going to sound a theme of the need to spread our chips beyond solar and wind uh, and talk about the roles for nuclear and carbon capture utilization and storage, or CCS, CCUS. And finally, winding up with what I really consider the carbon capture imperative. I'm going to go pretty fast, uh, but uh, you all are going to have access to, a, uh, to my PowerPoint. There's lots of links at the bottom of each slide uh, if you want to dive into some of the sources I, I quote. And we'll have some Q&A uh, at the end. So many of you are probably familiar with the 1.5 degrees report. It not only talked about the impacts of various uh, levels of warming, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees. Uh, it urged us to start focusing on trying to limit warming to 1.5 degrees rather than the kind of vague, uh, widely accepted target of two, two degrees that had held sway uh, for many years. It also laid out the kind of pathways we need to get on to limit warming to either 1.5 or 2 degrees. <clears throat> This is the rather daunting, rather scary chart. Again, many of you are probably familiar with it. That tells us where we are now as a globe, emitting roughly 40 gigatons of CO2 per year, and how we need to get on a very steep slope of decreases. So we're emitting roughly net zero emissions, uh, maybe some positive emissions, maybe taking some out of the atmosphere by mid-century. Beyond that, we're going to have to even uh, do, do more. The, uh, the IPCC looked at dozens and dozens of computer simulations of how uh, the world's economies could get there. And I want to uh, emphasize three major takeaways from all that analysis of mitigation pathways. First of all, yes, we need transformations across all sectors. The power sector, our buildings, our transportation systems, and our industry. I'm focusing on CO2 here from the energy sector. As I'm sure many of you know, there are five other greenhouse gases. Uh, there's also black carbon. There are many different contributors. But the battle is going to be won or lost on what we do on CO2. It's about 80% of the problem. But we also need to work on the other five greenhouse gases, too. Renewable electricity, meaning largely solar, solar and wind. In the IPCC modeling, they believe that with the cost decreases we have seen over the last 10 years, 
we could have globally a system that's 60 to 80 percent powered by wind and solar by 2050. That's great news and comes in at a cost far less than we thought 10, 10 years ago. But we're going to explore why that's not 100 percent. Why not 100 percent renewables in the electricity sector? Finally, the big takeaway, as, as, as you can see, past 2050, global CO2 emissions should actually turn negative. We need to find ways to actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere because we are likely to overshoot the levels that would hold warming to 1.5 degrees or to 2 degrees. That is also a daunting challenge, but doable. And everything I say today about the pathways we can get on can be done with technology that is currently, commercial, uh, currently commercial or is near commercial. We are testing it in laboratories or we're doing demonstrations. And you know, we'll also have more technology innovation over the next 30 years that we can barely imagine now. And those te that technology innovation always, almost always brings uh, pleasant surprises. So this, this is doable. Let's talk about the transformations. Uh, there are four basic strategies that appear in all of the deep decarbonization literature on how we get there. And I want to focus first on energy, of energy efficiency. Just across all end uses in the economy, we need to be as efficient as possible. We have been trying since Amory Levin's writing in the 1970s to make our economy more efficient. We know we can squeeze more use out of every BTU or every kilowatt hour we use. We make uh, you know, gradual progress toward that goal. There's still a long way to go. We know that with currently com technology or near commercial, we can take the dollars of uh, the uh, uh, BTUs per dollar of GDP from about 3 million BTU per thousand dollars of G GDP and cut it by two thirds over the next 30 years. If we're smart, if we apply the technologies we know work. Once we make every, every end use as efficient as possible, the next step is to electrify as many end uses as possible, to substitute the direct use of electricity for the combustion of fossil fuels. <clears throat> and we, we're already starting to do that with electric hybrids, plug-in hybrids, all electric cars in the transportation sector. We know we could switch from gas water heating to heat pumps, gas hot water to electric uh, uh, water heating. Um, and so this, and across industry, there is a number of applications we could use more direct electricity or use electricity to create a zero carbon fuel like hydrogen or synthetic methane. And so in this particular study done by Jim Williams and the consulting group EER uh, that came out last year, they charted pathways for the US where we go from about 20% direct use of electricity across our end uses to triple that to 60% of all end use energy. We know how to do that. Finally, no, actually number three, not finally, if we're going to generate, if we're going to electrify the economy, our, we're going to demand a lot more electricity, we have to decarbonize that electricity. And we can do that through a variety of technologies, solar PV, solar thermal, wind, geothermal, hydro, nuclear, and carbon capture used with fossil fuels or biomass. All of those are either zero, electric, zero carbon generation or very low carbon generation. And applying those, we can take our tons per gigawatt hour uh, in the electricity sector from over 300 down to below 50 or even lower depending on the generation mix. Those three things combined can take us uh, way down this pathway. The fourth strategy, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, is carbon capture. We can apply it in power generation. We can apply it in industry. And ultimately, we can apply it to actually removing carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. These are the four big strategies that can get us down that road to net zero. What does this cost? Uh, the good news is the cost of getting on these pathways has come way down. Also from the Jim Williams study, this is a really fascinating chart of how 
the, uh, how much, uh, what percent of, of GDP have we spent on supplying energy to the US going way back to 1970? And you see the giant spike uh, with the two OPEC uh, oil embargoes of, of, of the 70s and then decreasing. This is driven a lot by oil costs and then fluctuating kind of in the six to eight to nine percent range uh, over the last 20 years. Sort of the baseline projection of what we will spend on energy if we don't solve the climate problem is kind of a steady decrease from six de declining more as the economy grows but you know energy remains relatively abundant and cheap. If we get on any one of this study's uh, seven pathways consistent with a three, ultimately getting to 350 ppm by the end of the century, essentially taking the US to net zero by 2050, we are spending you know, two to three percent additional on GD, uh, of our GDP on, on clean energy uh, instead of the baseline case. What that means is just staying in the same kind of range that historically uh, we've been at. And this is true globally as well as uh, for the US. So solving climate does not mean the end of Western civilization. It does not mean that we tank the economy. We can, we can afford this. Uh, it's far more costly not to do this. This is a complex chart that gives you a feel for those transformations across uh, uh, buildings, transportation, industry, and what happens to various energy sources. Uh, so on the top you have demand for liquids, meaning largely you know, petroleum, natural gas, and electricity, uh, and then on the bottom the supply. Let's see what happens. How would we transform our use of petroleum liquids? What, where we are here with uh, 30 quads, mostly of oil fueling our transportation sector, we can take that way down and instead we can substitute electricity in our vehicles. Natural gas, a bunch of it is used in our commercial and residential buildings. We can squeeze that down with the technologies I described and, uh, and electrify it. Uh, on the supply side, our, our liquids, our fossil fuels, decrease dramatically, we supplement them with some renewable fuels. Uh, we probably don't want to keep making ethanol, but we can make biofuels, biodiesel, uh, things like that, and uh, lower content with, with carbon capture. On the supply side, natural gas remains an element of, of, of the economy in this, in this kind of pathway. Uh, it decreases uh, overall use, but as we ramp up the electricity supply, and again, like I said, when you electrify everything, you've got to produce a lot more power. Natural gas still plays a role. We get to about 67% renewables, largely wind and solar with, with our, sort of our existing hydro too. We, in this scenario, we keep nuclear flat for about 20 years, but then with a new generation of reactors, that uh, the nuclear component could increase. The wonderful thing about this study that, uh, again, was actually done for the Our Children's Trust lawsuit back uh, and released in 2019, is that the modelers have sort of a, a base case with nuclear and CCS in, along with renewables, along with uh, land use changes that, that remove uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. And they kind of play, what's that game, Django, where you pull the blocks out? Um, okay, they, they, sh they show a scenario, so if we don't, uh, if we don't expand nuclear, what happens? What do we have to do? Uh, if we don't have good land use, what do we do? If we don't succeed in elect electrifying the economy as, as much. So you'll, you would, uh, if you read that study, you'll see how this is, uh, how there's kind of a push me, pull me thing when you pull options out. One thing that they did not pull out because they couldn't was some development of carbon capture technology. Uh, they could not get to net zero without some applications uh, of carbon capture. <clears throat> so we saw in the IPCC studies that we got to 60 to 80 percent solar and wind uh, by, uh, by, by 2050. We saw that same re result in the U.S. modeling that I just showed, which is also consistent across, say, the Obama long-term strategy report that came out in 2016 and other modeling that I would call sort of mainstream modeling of how, how do we decarbonize the power sector. Just want to give you two other examples. Here's uh, the European Union's Clean Planet for All report from 2018, uh, where they showed how they can grow their renewables 
uh, to 80 to 81 to 85% by 2050 in their decarbonization pathways. Uh, 65 to 72% of that is wind and solar. The rest is some hydro and biomass. As they phase out fossil fuels in the power sector, the black diamonds, and keep nuclear relatively constant, uh, although it shrinks as a percentage of, of, of total generation. Again, this is kind of mainstream modeling of how to get there. And the final example I'll give you is from IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Authority, which is a collaboration of about 20 governments worldwide designed to promote renewable energy uh, across, across the globe. They put out a roadmap last year on how to uh, get to, near, uh, to, to net zero by 2050. And they too it, come up with a very similar uh, model for the power sector where globally we could get 86% of our power from renewables. A chunk of that is hydro, a chunk of that is bioenergy. About 62% is your solar and wind chunk, mostly solar PV and wind, small uh, chunk of concentrated uh, solar thermal power. So this is all kind of a very consistent picture. But how do we reconcile that with the headlines that often scream out of the trade press or the newspapers? Renewables are winning the battle against coal and gas on economic terms. Solar costs and wind costs are so low, they're cheaper than existing coal and nuclear, according to Lazard. Uh, Wood Mackenzie, solar plants are cheaper than natural gas just about everywhere by 2023. Why would we not just build electricity sector entirely of cheap solar and wind? One key to this is that these, this cost comparison, this, this assertion that solar and wind are cheaper than anything else relies on a metric called the levelized cost of energy, meaning elect electrical energy. And to understand that puzzle, we, we need to do a little, a little dive on that. As I said at the outset, there has been a revolution in renewables. Uh, the levelized cost of energy from a wind and solar plant has declined dramatically over the last 10 years. Uh, economies of scale plus, uh, plus innovation. The cost of wind in the U.S. has decreased about 70% on an LCOE basis. Cost of PV solar has declined about 90% over the last 10 years on an LCOE basis. Uh, so wind, 28 to $54 a megawatt hour, depending on location. Utility scale solar, big plants, not rooftop solar, 36 to $44 a megawatt hour. But what does this mean? What, is, what does the LCO mean? That means just looking at that plant by itself in isolation, cranking out power uh, according to whatever pattern it is capable of. You can do this for a coal plant or gas plant or nuclear plant, wind, solar. It looks at it in isolation. Uh, so a nuclear plant might run 24 seven most of the year, except for refueling. A wind plant is gonna have sort of a stochastic pattern uh, across seasons, across days. But just look at the average cost of what that, uh, what that plant puts out. That's an important thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> when we take that metric of LCOE and stack it up against other types of generation, we find this. This is the, the, the outfits that, put that, that pump out these LCOE numbers are places like Lazard Consulting, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, BNEF. Wood McKenzie. Um, so they rack up sort of similar numbers that we just saw to say, here's onshore wind, you know, cheaper than $60 a megawatt hour, tracking solar voltaic, non-tracking solar voltaic. Not sure why they have large hydro in here because we're not really building any more large hydro uh, in the US. We've taken up all the sites. And here's combined cycle natural gas uh, turbine uh, and Look at these numbers, it looks like the solar and wind have now sunk below the total cost uh, of building a new gas plant. And I also note that if you run numbers for nuclear, coal, coal with carbon capture, gas peaking plants, gas with CCS, they would all, they all, they would all be higher here uh, than, than these numbers in the kind of 20, 30, $40 uh, megawatt hour. But as you can, probably guess, we need to keep in, in mind uh, 
that power systems are not built of one plant. Like let's just build, let's just find the cheapest plant and build lots of that. Power plant, power systems are built of different kinds of plants playing different roles based on their capabilities and, and relative costs. So I like to describe this as the riddle of cheap renewables and high system costs. This is just a thought experiment from some authors at Google from a couple years ago. They asked themselves, what if, what if I had a power system of just kind of dispatchable nice gas plants that cost me four cents uh, a kilowatt hour, and what if I started to try to decarbonize that with just one type of power plant, add nothing but solar to that power system? The system costs stay steady for a while, but eventually they start escalating. Why? Because if you just keep throwing solar on nothing but solar, then you're throwing in a production pattern that just peaks in the middle of the day, drops to nothing for, for 12 hours, the 12 hours of nighttime. What if we did that with just wind? Just tried to decarbonize going from 0% uh, 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 zero carbon facilities up to 100% zero carbon generation. Just keep throwing wind on over and over. The system costs stay stable for a while, but then eventually you get that nonlinear effect. And finally, even if you tried to back out all of your natural gas with nothing but nuclear, uh, system costs stay stable for a while, but eventually turn up. Why, why is that? Why does this phenomenon happen in all the studies I've looked at that, that ask that question? This is, a, this is another illustration from, from that, illustration from that same Google study where they asked sort of the same question, but this time let's, let's do sort of a mixture of solar and wind. Let's throw in some batteries. Let's start with zero renewables and zero batteries and see what happens as we build out and add more and more solar and wind and batteries and start backing out the gas. You get a steady system cost for a while, but then you have this nonlinear phenomenon. What happens? Why does that happen in these projections of very high renewable systems? It's related to something called integration costs. And do we have any electrical engineers in, in the room? No, okay. Um, um, because of the intermittent nature, the variable nature of solar and wind, we have to take certain steps to keep the lights on, to keep it reliable when it, fl when it fluctuates, as opposed to power plants th that are very highly reliable. They still break down sometimes, but you, you control them uh, when they operate, and sometimes you can ramp them up, you can ramp them down to follow load. But it's different in a high solar and wind situation. The first thing we try to do to address that variability is build transmission lines to aggregate solar and wind over a bigger geographic area. The bigger geographic area you can aggregate over, you have sort of the law of large numbers and the output smooths out to some extent. Transmission is not free. That's an integration cost. Second thing we can do, and we're starting to do, is load shifting, demand response. Try to move your demand for power to when the sun is shining, to when the wind is blowing. We can do this somewhat with the pricing mechanism, charging different prices different times a day. We can do it with programs that use all sorts of cool, uh, cool software to cycle your air conditioner or turn on your uh, electric clothes dryer here and there. We can ask industry to shut down certain hours and give them some economic benefit for that. We can shift percentages of demand here and there. Some people think we could shift 20% or more move load around, but it's not costless. There are prices to pay for shifting load around. That's an integration cost. The third one that we've heard a lot about, and again, there's lots of good news, is storage. As you've probably heard, the cost of lithium battery storage has dropped dramatically also recently. Uh, we are now often, we're, we're doing, utilities are often installing four to six hours of storage uh, on, on their systems. Sometimes plants are, are co-located with storage. That's letting us push abundant solar in the daytime into four to six hours into the evening and avoiding those dramatic ramp-ups of other power sources 
uh, when, when the sun sets. Batteries are still not free. Uh, we're, we're doing some uh, you know, steps to deal with sort of the daily fluctuation of, uh, of, of wind and solar, but there are also seasonal differences in wind and solar production. In the winter, solar production is lowest for obvious reasons, distance from the sun, angle of the sun. Wind patterns vary by season. And uh, again, depending on, on weather and climactic patterns, it varies by country to country. We tend to have lower wind production, uh, I think in the s summer is actually lower than uh, spring or fall. I'll have, to double check, I'll have to double check that, but again, depends on the country. Um, there's also just weather fluctuation. Sometimes you have weather patterns that just shut down solar and wind for days. Uh, what, do you, what do you do in those situations? What's your integration cost to deal with that? What a number of modelers do when they project heavy renewable systems is actually deliberately create overgeneration in some months. In other words, if uh, solar and wind production bottom out in the fall and December, just build the system uh, uh, really large to produce as much power as you need. That system is then overbuilt in spring and summer and you have lots of surplus power. If you do nothing with it, that drives your system costs up. We need to start thinking about if we have overbuilt systems, we want to use that spare electricity, say, to create hydrogen if we're not using it in our buildings or industry or, or our transportation systems. Uh, so the layman sort of explanation for why does this happen at some point is that those integration costs are real and they get spread over narrower, more infrequent periods. Large capital costs, they think of batteries that might be amortized over only a couple of days per year. That's what drives this. The exact shape of that curve depends on the system. How much transmission have you built? How much load shifting are you capable of doing? So there's, it's not necessarily always 80 or always 60. Maybe it can be 90 and so But it's kind of like a law of diminishing returns for the economists in the room. You can't just keep throwing the same input into a production process over and over without getting diminishing returns. I love the German language. <laughs> they have a, word, a long word for everything. Just as an illustration, Dunkerflaute, the dark doldrums. This is not a computer simulation. This is a real record of what happens Pretty, at least once a year in the winter in Germany, the dark doldrums where for 10 days, give or take a couple of days, the weather patterns, it's really cloudy and the wind dries up. And they have a dramatic drop in wind and solar production. What do they do now? They turn on their coal and gas plants. They're sort of legacy fossil fuel system and their emissions shoot up for, the, for, those, for those days. But this is the kind of thing that power system planners need to compensate for, and it's what all of us thinking about what kind of electricity system we're going to build, how do we deal with this? Uh, there's also simulated um, uh, 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 that that happen in uh, polar vortex uh, periods uh, during, during the, uh, in the U.S. So I want to go back and illustrate those integration costs in a little more concrete way here, we've already seen this slide. Looks like solar and wind are looking pretty good as standalone plants. But I want to show you the full graph from BNEF, where you just saw this part, right? Here's the rest of what they show, where they start illustrating the costs of integration. So you look at what happens when we start throwing just four hours of storage onto a wind plant. Well, we might get up close to 100 over $100 a megawatt hour. What happens when we throw $4 of batteries on a solar v PV plant? Well, we're up to $176 a megawatt hour. Uh, what is the cost of demand response? Um, I haven't dug into the origin of these numbers, so I, I can't tell you what's behind them, but it's their representation of a range of what that load shifting and demand response would cost on a dollars per megawatt hour. <laughs> Uh, this is a peaker plant, which we just run as few hours as we can, open cycle generate gas turbine. Uh, just a pure four hours of utility scale batteries is way up uh, in the, uh, uh, the 170s, 180s. Uh, 
and new pumped hydro systems. That's a form of storage. Uh, it's the largest form of storage we have right now. They're often decades and decades old. If we try to build more pump storage systems, it's pretty expensive. So these are the integration costs that drive up the average system cost uh, that we have to be concerned about. <clears throat> Counterpoint. And by the way, I'm not here to bash renewables. I'm not anti-renewables. I want renewables to carry as much of the load as possible. There are uh, experts, largely a couple of academic groups in uh, Australia, Finland, and this is Mark Jacobson out of Stanford, that do run models that say, I can get you 100% renewables. Not only just for the electricity sector, I can supply uh, energy across the oil economy. They are not in the mainstream of modelers. This is a, a group, I personally, I believe that they make rather heroic assumptions uh, to get there, uh, heroic on the, uh, the amount of load shifting that is possible, on how far battery costs will drop, and how they, mo when they model the entire world, they model uh, integrated transmission systems across entire continents, entire continent of Latin America, entire continent of Africa, the entire Middle East is one kumbaya transmission system. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Um, the, um, and uh, there are plenty of groups that, um, there, there's NGOs devoted to 100% renewables. There's mayors that want to buy 100% clean, which really in this case means kind of 100% renewables. We have corporations that have said we want to buy 100% renewables. Now, those organizations are increasing use of renewables, which is good. And the big integration costs are not going to happen in the next couple of years. They're going to happen out in the 2030s, 2040s, if we stay on this trajectory. Uh, so some people say, don't, don't worry about it now. Uh, Budweiser even wants you to know that they're going to brew their beer with 100% wind. Um, and again, this might be a successful uh, marketing campaign. But I want to urge you all to think about solving the climate problem as uh, a question of what, are you, what solutions are you going to bet on to solve this? Are you going to put all your chips on a couple technologies or are you going to spread your chips across multiple technologies? Um, there are vehement arguments to leave it all in the ground, stop fossil fuel use as quickly as possible, do not use fossil fuel in power plants or an industry even with carbon capture that takes the, the emissions and stores them safely underground. There are, are people who say, shut down the existing reactors as quickly as possible, or maybe run them, but don't build any new ones. Uh, these are value judgments about relative risks, and I respect the people, their, their opinions to say, the, the cost of the risks of nuclear are completely unacceptable. Uh, the the risks of uh, fossil fuel use are are just unacceptable, because there's environmental risks of you know production of them and transportation, etc. But there are also risks with almost any form of energy. There are risks of all the aluminum mining and steel mining you need to do to build windmills, um, and uh, there's land use impacts. Of, uh, of any energy source. So I encourage you to think about uh, trading off risks against each other. Uh, and if you put, you know, if you take nuclear off the table, what's left and how will you supply the world's energy needs? If you pull CCS off, what do you do? If you pull both off, you're effectively putting all your chips on a, hand, on a handful of technologies that may or may not uh, solve this problem. <clears throat> Spread your chips, my personal philosophy. Uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, a watchdog NGO for the nuclear industry for many years, has looked at this risk-risk trade-off, and they've concluded we should keep our existing reactors operating if they have a good safety record and the costs are reasonable. We also have some promising designs for small modular reactors that are at the pilot stage. Uh, that, that development is, is worth watching. We may want to, as a society and as a globe, put a few chips on that one. 
uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, the oil and gas industry has been doing it successfully for years to enhance oil recovery on existing reservoirs. We know we can keep it underground once we pump it, pump it down. There's also uh, great innovation going on in this sector too. I'd encourage you to become familiar with uh, a company called Net Power demonstrating a 50 megawatt gas plant in Texas right now that achieves 100% capture of CO2 emissions. I know I'm getting short on time, but boy, there's one really important thing. Industry emissions, we're gonna need carbon capture. Um, I wanna spend just a couple minutes on this big task, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. How do we do that? We can think of several ways. On the right-hand side here, you see what's called the natural solutions. Uh, No-till farming and other agricultural processes, uh, practices that store more soil, excuse me, it, that uh, uh, store carbon in the, in the soil. Uh, we can plant trees, we can restore degrade, degraded lands, and we can enhance, we can literally remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by growing more trees. And then there's the technical means, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, growing dedicated energy plants to then uh, burn in biomass plants, capture the CO2, it has a net negative impact. And we're even piloting, piloting something called direct air capture, a very energy intensive process that literally removes those 400 parts per million of CO2 out of the air, concentrates it, is ready to use or store underground. So those are, those are some options. There's other, there's other things at the, at the research stage, enhanced weathering rocks and minerals, seawater capture. But let's go back to the IPCC pathways. There, they, they showed us four illustrative pathways uh, among the many dozens of modeling exercises they, re they reviewed. So you'll see the, you know, the familiar toboggan slide that I showed you earlier in, in the four pathways. What they illustrated was depending on, on how fast we can get our emissions down, we're either gonna need a little bit of carbon dioxide removal or more or even more or even a lot. And the color coding here shows the limits of what we can do with AFALU, agriculture, forestry, and land use practice. These are the natural means of soils and forests. It can be an important slab of removing CO2 from the atmosphere, but there's a limit to how much we can do with that. And uh, the IPC has, has scored those out. The yellow part they coded in their original report as BECS, as bioenergy with carbon capture. But this too could, it could uh, involve some, uh, some constraints. You start planting that many dedicated energy crops, what happens? You start competing with food production and uh, affecting biodiversity. Uh, so many in the environmental community don't like the idea of direct air capture, don't like the idea of bioenergy with CCS. They wanna use the natural means. They wanna restrict us to AFALU, agricultural forestry. And so P1 and P2 look a lot, a lot more attractive. But if you dig deeper into the IPCC report, you look at what, what underlies P1, P2, P3, P4. What are the global energy demand projections? And this takes a little bit of digging and, 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 uh, uh, and fixing the legends of the original report. But what this chart shows is exajoules of primary energy consumption globally. And we, in, 20, in 2015, we are about at 600 exajoules. P1 and P2 assume a dramatic drop by 2030 of almost a third of global energy consumption. It makes assumptions like we, the dramatic movement to plant-based diets, uh, slower population growth, uh, other lifestyle changes to a less energy intensive lifestyle world, worldwide, um, all of which personally I would welcome in many ways, but is it realistic to think that that's gonna happen? Drops from 600 to 400 exajoules by 2030 and then leveling off or even further decreases. I think we have to be prepared instead 
for growth in energy consumption. And the P3, P4 shows steady or increasing growth in energy demand. Um, if P3 and P4 is a more realistic view of the world, or at least we need to be ready for that, then we have to be ready to do this. We need some form of technological CDR. So uh, this is what I call the carbon capture imperative. We need to start moving now to innovate on carbon capture, start to deploy and scale up and put all the regulatory systems in place for safety and the public acceptance, not because we're going to deploy it today, but we're going to have to start deploying it 2030, 2040, and the lead times for that technology are not measured in months. They're measured in years and years. I think we're going to definitely need it for carbon dioxide removal. We're definitely going to need it for certain industrial sources. It is likely to play a role uh, in electricity generation. Uh, and um, uh, and I, I don't put, uh, personally, I don't put a lot of uh, uh, belief behind the idea that developing carbon capture creates a moral hazard that, oh, we'll, we'll, you know, we're not going to worry so much about climate because we can take, uh, we can capture carbon dioxide. But again, that's something we, might, we may want to deal with in Q&A. So my key message is, how do we solve this? Be efficient, electrify everything, produce mountains of zero carbon electricity, <coughs> use a broad portfolio of technologies, uh, make sure we innovate and bring lots of options to the, to the table, because we're going to need many beyond uh, solar and wind. Spread our chips. And also in the discussion, I've mo a lot been talking about a US perspective, uh, but we also need to think globally. Uh, the US is a technology leader. If we don't innovate in some of these areas, I'm not sure other countries are going to bring these technologies to fruit. So even if we don't think we're going to need a technology, we may want to do the R, D, and D anyway, because developing countries may need it. Eastern Europe may need it. Countries that are not blessed with the kind of hydro and land and wind and sun uh, that we have. So thanks very much. I, l I look forward to uh, your questions. <laughs>